It is truly awesome to be here today. Yeah. I have three things that I would like to share with you uh, today. I want to talk about you know, diversity and inclusion in general, why it's important for organizations and why is it such a, such a hype as a whole. But I also want to shed light on the problems that I see currently in the practice and how organizations sometimes are trying to approach uh, diversity and inclusion. And then finally, I would like to, you know, I try to summarize maybe three takeaways that you can take with you that can help you think about when I start and if I start my, my business, how can I integrate diversity and inclusion from day one of my startup and not wait until I'm a very uh, mature stage of the organization and have to work backwards to fix mistakes that had happened before. So, um, as I told you, I work a lot with, uh, with, uh, in consulting with public and private sector, and I've worked a lot with startups, but oftentimes people who come to me are at, at a, a more mature level, at the, you know, the scale-up phase, or maybe uh, small organizations and medium-sized organizations that have grown and have been focusing on the product or um, you know, how to gain market share and so on, but they had forgotten to think about the culture that they have built within the organization. And they come at that stage saying like, okay, we have an issue. We feel that there is, uh, you know, uh, we lack diversity or people are not comfortable or people are not speaking up. And we start working backwards to fix it up. And that's not necessarily the, you know, it, even though it is um, the approach that many organizations are taking now, trying to create diversity and inclusion initiatives and, you know, uh, taking it very seriously, there are things that we can do from the early stages in, in order to start making a change. But let's consider together why our organizations today uh, engaging in that? Why are they spending so much money and effort and, and energy in uh, um, diversity and inclusion initiatives as a whole? So diversity usually refers to you know, the differences between uh, people, like the full spectrum of uh, um, human differences. And these can range from, you know, race, gender, sexual orientation, age, personality. There are so many differences that exist between us, and that's what diversity usually refers to. Whereas inclusion, it's more about the feeling that you, that you have within the organization. It's not about the, uh, how many people I have from different backgrounds, but about how do these people feel within the organization. Now, the initiatives that are happening, you know, there are many very well-documented benefits for organizations. I, I got these, found, the, found these, like, there's arguments that, you know, when you have people from different backgrounds, you will have better ideas, you will even understand maybe your market better because you will be targeting uh, people who are very varied. So the more wider the representation within your organization, the better, you know, you are at, at understanding uh, your customers. But also there's arguments about creativity, arguments about increased profits, about, you know, more uh, boosting morale, and even arguments about, you know, uh, the, the image of your organization and the, the uh, brand value as a whole, how people perceive you um, uh, as a whole. And I got you some numbers and some statistics to support that, actually. So um, companies with higher than average diversity showed uh, in a study um, that was reported in Harvard uh, Business Review, showed 19% higher innovation revenues. And there's another um, um, study also by McKinsey, it's a McKinsey report that shows that companies in the top quartile of racial diversity are 35% more likely to outperform to surpass their peer organizations. And if you look at the same top quartile in terms of gender diversity, also the percentage is 15% more likely to do the same. Um, additional also information, there's a study that was done by PwC, it's a CEO survey that they do uh, on a regular basis, and in that survey, 85% of CEOs who were uh, surveyed indicated that having inclusiveness strategy uh, improved their bottom line, it had a direct uh, impact on their profitability as an organization. Companies with the most women board directors also outperformed those with the, um, with the, with the least on um, uh, invested capital by 26%. And that's a study by the Catalyst in 2011. And the statistics are even improving now that we have uh, more data that is being collected in more uh, recent times. 
But the issue is not, you know, on one hand, we have all those benefits that have been documented and, and you know, we're seeing more um, statistics that are confirming these uh, changes and their benefit. But there's also demographic changes that are making it important for organizations to think about diversity and inclusion very seriously. This is um, some statistics from the US. So here, um, this is showing which generations, and they've divided the generations. I think it's a little bit small from your side, so I will, I will read it out. So we have the silent generations who are uh, above the age of 76. We have the baby boomers, age 57 to 75 at the moment. Gen X, who are currently 41 to 56. And then the millennials, between 25 and 40. And finally, Gen Z, who are between 9 and 24 at the moment. And if we think about the people who are in most power at the moment, these are how the uh, percentages are. So still you have the dominance is the baby boomers who are in the age range of 57 to 75 and then the uh, Gen X. But then you see that the millennials and Gen Z are obviously going to be the ones who take, take over that um, uh, with time. Why is that important? You know, eventually these people will age, will retire, and these people will start taking over. Why is that important? It's important because millennials and Gen Z, those last two, have uh, you know uh, are the most diverse in history of generations. In fact, this is also data from the U.S. Seventy-two percent of uh, baby boomers uh, in the U.S. were white. Whereas 56% of the millennials uh, in the US are currently white. And imagine with time, as time passes, these statistics are going to uh, change even more. And in fact, I've even noticed that, you know, from, forget about data, from like, you know, just uh, being um, with, a, with a, my Finnish husband for 17 years, I've been coming here for a very long time. And at the beginning, you know, uh, I noticed that with time, Finland has become much more diverse. You can see it, you can feel it. 17 years ago till now, really, not only in Helsinki, but mainly, I've, you know, the, uh, I've noticed it a lot in Turku, where my husband comes, comes from. As we wait for the, okay. Um, but then uh, there's another reason, other than the demographics and all the other benefits and profitability and so on, there's another reason why we need to take this seriously, is that mainly, Talent is asking for diversity. There's a study by Glassdoor that showed that 67% uh, of job seekers consider workplace diversity as a very important factor. And there's 50% of current employees are asking for their organization or wish for their organizations to be more diverse. So if this is the talent that now is in the market and I'm an organization who needs to or wants to attract talent, don't I want to listen to what the talent is telling me and try to go with that, uh, with that in that direction? So there's so many reasons for us to um, take it seriously and many reasons that are telling us why organizations today are actually spending all this effort, money, time, energy in uh, DE&I initiatives. But still, at least in my mind and in the mind of, of uh, several others, there is a problem. Things are not pink and dandy and flowery as we wish them to be. Some of the approaches that organizations are taking at the moment is that, okay, we notice that all our leadership are one color, one gender, one age, one whatever. So what do we do? We start using quotas. We start putting quotas. I want to increase the number of uh, representation of women on boards. I want to increase the number of women in, um, in leadership positions. It's wonderful. I am so glad to hear. Quotas are important because they will push organizations to actually make a difference. But the problem is that quotas alone are not enough. Because who is on your team is important. It's important that I have you know, different representations of different communities, but that alone is not important. What is important is how are those people voicing their op opinions, contributing in the organization, making their voices heard, and how are they interacting and being interacted with in the organization. I'll give you an example of a study that was done by Google a while back. They actually wanted to know, because you know, Google, massive, and you know, they're sponsoring this, uh, this event as well. So they wanted to know, why do we have you know, one organization that has so many teams, but different teams perform at different levels of success? It's interesting. Isn't it an interesting question? 
you know. I also, as an organizational psychologist who studies people and organizations, I study individual differences, I want to know what makes people successful. And this is a question that, as organizational psychologists, we always ask ourselves. The study showed that you know, they, they actually had lots of data. They collected data on personality, on backgrounds, socioeconomic status, all sorts of data about each person and what makes them unique. But then they realized that you know, there wasn't any specific concoction of personalities and skills and backgrounds and nationalities or whatever that, um, that made a difference. It wasn't who was part of the equation. It wasn't the who that made the difference. In fact, they found two main things. One is that um, social sensitivity teams that had higher levels of social sensitivity and understanding of each other and listening and tuning in to others performed better. And also teams that had higher uh, conversational contribution, so all team members almost equally like had the opportunity to speak up and talk and so on. But what does that mean? The main lesson learned here is that, again, it's the how are people interacting with each other, not only the who, that is making the difference. That was the key finding from that. So that pointed to the idea of a concept that we refer to in, in organizational psychology as psychological safety. Feeling psychologically safe is when you are in a place where you feel like I can talk, I can say my opinion. I don't have to think twice, like, oh, are they gonna say that I'm stupid? Uh, oh, are, am I gonna be attacked for saying something that is radically different and so on? And this feeling of psychological safety is very important because the argument of diversity and the argument of all of this is that I want to bring in people from diverse backgrounds because I know that all those people have different ideas and opinions. So what's the point of having all those people and then putting them in a place where they can't share their opinions and ideas. It kind of defeats the purpose, right? Have you been in a situation like this before, where you're sitting in a team and there's the elephant sitting right next to you on the side, and um, everyone's sitting there silent, not breathing, and performance is the declining, everything is, is going bad, but no one's opening their mouth. This is the perfect image of how a psychologically unsafe environment is. This is the feeling that it triggers in the people who exist within it. And those people, when we, when I, as a member of a team, feel like I'm in a place where I'm psychologically unsafe, I will not be utilizing my skills to the best, uh, to the best of my uh, capabilities. The organization will not be, be benefiting from me and from my top performance. Because I am hindered and I am limited. So there's also a very fine line between tokenism and representation. There's, you know, um, uh, one of those other problems is that when organizations start increasing the number, I want more uh, women on boards, more women on uh, whatever. Sometimes, if it's only done from a diversity perspective and not an inclusion perspective, what ends up happening is this feeling like, am I the diversity hire? Have I been hired there because I'm olive skin? Or because I'm a woman? Or because I'm young? Or because I'm whatever, disabled, is that the reason why I'm hired? Or is it because of my competence and skills and true belief that my different background actually will make a difference in your organization? That's the feeling that we want to have. But unfortunately, it backfires when you only think from the perspective of diversity and not from uh, inclusion. So what can we do? I think the first thing we need to understand is that diversity is not inclusion. We agree on that? Mm -hmm. Great. So diversity is not inclusion. Diversity is like being invited, and I, I can keep on thinking about my son who's uh, very big uh, uh, in sports, like he's uh, competing at the moment in tournaments, etc. And I admire a lot of the things that they're doing in their team. Um, because, you know, diversity is being invited to join the team, but inclusion is actually being invited to join the game and play regardless of your shortcomings and your strengths. It's actually leveraging what you have to offer and bringing you on board to be properly part of the team. And these are two distinct uh, concepts, really. So, in order to, um, to try to do something uh, about it, first we need to also agree that inclusion is a mindset. As a startup, you're not going to start up with like employing 20 people and, and 30 people. You will grow into that, right? But if you are to grow into that, 
what you can do from the very beginning is have inclusion truly and genuinely as uh, the background mindset that you have. So the first thing is, uh, I have three recommendations that I'm gonna share with you. One is to integrate inclusivity in your vision and in your strategy and in your mission and so on. Second is to create psychologically safe environment for your, uh, for your employees. And third is to foster an environment where people can bring their whole selves, not part of the self and leave the other part at home because the other part is not welcomed in this organization. So I'm gonna shed a little bit more light on each of these. So first, integrate inclusivity in your uh, strategy and values. So um, as startups, you have the opportunity to be major change agents today. Startups um, are in a unique position to change the world. They're young, they're agile, they're born in the millennial era, they have funding, hopefully, uh, they have a new product or app that can change the world. But by creating the environment and the workplace that is right, you can actually also change the world a little bit, one step at a time. Putting thinking about inclusivity in your strategy, it doesn't necessarily mean I need to like make sure that I'm starting to hire uh, X, Y, and Z and I'm starting the representation when I'm a small team. Rather, it's about thinking, how am I positioning myself and my product and, and, uh, that I'm, uh, or the service that I'm providing? Do people know and can people feel the inclusivity in our brand, in our image, in our, uh, the, the feeling when they deal and, and work with us? You can start from there and then eventually and slowly you start growing into it. And integrating it from the beginning in your strategy is much better and much easier path than waiting until you grow and you're at a stage where you're like a, a small organization and start having to go backwards and fix up uh, uh, everything um, along the way. Second is creating psychologically safe environment. And to do that, really, there are few um, recommendations. I found this uh, interesting, um, th this interesting, like a simple five point um, explanation. So one, make it explicit, an explicit priority. So explicitly saying it, and that will, will be done also partly in your strategy if you make it in part of your mission and your vision and so on. Facilitate everyone speaking up. Be attuned to how do people interact in my organization? Do they, who, who is heard most of the time? Is everyone speaking? Is everyone uh, voicing their opinion, coming up? Is everyone comfortable to make mistakes? And how are mistakes dealt with? These are questions that you as, you know, the person who's starting up a business need to critically think about because this will set the norm of your organization. And once the norms are set, they're very difficult to change. They will take a much longer time to change. So establish norms for how failure is handled. Create a space for new ideas, even wild ideas. And also embrace productive conflict. It is not okay for people not to engage in conflict. We disagree all the time. But we can disagree in a good way and come up to an agreement, even if the agreement is that we agree not to agree. But at the end of the day, we can do it in a constructive way or we can do it in a way where like people start hiding conflict and like, you know, let's put it under the carpet so no one hears, I'm gonna shove my feelings deep uh, inside rather than have to engage in this conversation. So these are important because if you think about your, the norms that you're establishing, even when you're a two person team, a three person team, a five person team, how are we interacting with each other? This is likely to transmit as you increase your team and as you become big enough, it will become very difficult to change those norms. So do it right from the very beginning. Third, foster an environment where people can bring their, their whole selves. And here I have a small, um, like a template that we used uh, as the basic model that we relied on when we created the toolkit for organizations. So really what we wanted to do is that one, to go to organizations and tell them, okay, what's happening uh, with you? Are you interested in making your organization more inclusive? Yes, fantastic. So we're gonna ask you a set of questions and the questions are around those areas because all of these areas together create the feeling of inclusivity. So these things, these include 
policies at the policy level, how are you protecting your employees? How are you protecting the people inside? Are you ensuring that people are, you know, th there is a way to protect against harassment, uh, verbal, um, you know, sexual harassment, all sorts of uh, incidents that actually are uncomfortable, make the place uncomfortable in general. Um, grievance policy benefits. Have you thought about the benefits that you are providing inclusive benefits from the beginning for everyone who might be there, whether they have kids or not, whether they have, you know, a heterosexual partner or or not? Or so, are you considering the inclusivity of the benefits that you're offering to people as well? And also, there's the practices. So, okay, fair enough. I could have lots of uh, rules and regulations and policies. This is what we like, what we don't like. But then, am I monitoring how these are being implemented? Am I training people? I cannot assume that people are born aware of what is politically correct or politically incorrect. Or, you know, sometimes people may offend you head on, but they don't do that. You know, in a lot of cases, they don't do that on purpose. In fact, they do that because they genuinely thought that this is harmless. So are you doing the training? Are you talking about it? How's the language that you're using in your communication? Is it inclusive? The, the climate we talked about, um, uh, the generally feeling that you have the support. Sometimes large organizations, we encourage a lot of like employee resource groups as well, support system where people can share. Um, and this is, for example, like um, the IWOF uh, and, and these entities, for example, the, uh, when you bring international women working in Finland together, they have something in common that they would like to discuss. And this is kind of like a resource group. It's not the support group per se, it's a resource group. So sometimes you would, you, it is helpful to have such resource groups within your organization, but of course, depending on the size. The structure from the dress code to the bathrooms to the systems that allow flexibility of choosing your own pronouns. Sometimes organizations, again, when they grow and they want to go back and be more inclusive, like, oh, but the software that we use doesn't allow us to, to choose or change, or it has Mr. and Mrs. as the only two options. Uh, and finally, outreach. When you're outreaching, when you're using social media, when you're using you know, your, your brand, you're, you're starting to spread your brand outside to, uh, to the world, are you reinforcing inclusivity in that? Are you uh, reinforcing diversity and inclusion as a whole as well? Are you utilizing this platform to kind of like show your support uh, in general? Finally, um, I came uh, across this picture that uh, says that innovation happens bottom up, but I actually replaced it with change happens bottom up. And what I mean by change happening bottom up, I mean like those small organizations. We don't always have to target large organizations and start making them change all the way they do things and start uh, refixing and so on. Sometimes change also can happen bottom up. If every single one of us starts creating a safe, uh, inclusive environment for the people that we work with, it could be a trickle-down effect and we could start having the power and making the world a better place one step at a time. Thank you very much. <laughs>